um, while my panelists join me, um, taking on from Shashi's remark, this panel is about new media and ICT platforms. Um, there's actually, it's a huge discussion. There is absolutely nothing that new media will not affect. I think five years from now, the way the new media will gobble up our lives, we will not, rec five years looking back, we won't recognize the way we live, the way we governed, the way we performed, the way we educated. I was thinking as when Shashi was talking about education, I'm wondering if in five years from now, we will not call them teachers, we'll call them facilitators. I think fundamentally when we look at it, here's the possibility that teachers become facilitators because as long as we, we hang on to keywords, what new media is doing is asking us to question every keyword that we belong to and I don't use that lightly. Keywords don't belong to us. After, after a while, we belong to keywords and we start acting in those keywords that have been essentially the way we have been structuring our lives and our organizations, any kind of organization and therefore we become slaves to those keywords. And what new media is forcing us to do is to relook at all those keywords, I hope in a very good way. There will be many, many challenges as we've already seen. But in education certainly, what will happen if what we ignore is student chatter, even kids chatter. When the teacher is talking to you, if the teacher becomes a facilitator, the kids will be chattering not to the, 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 the kids in the, in the class, but to kids all over the world. And now how do you take that chatter, take that chatter together and make the teacher endorse that chatter, provoke that chatter in a good way so that the education is happening, not, it's happening in the conversations that go on in new media. So I'm saying that even what we call teachers is probably going to change. Okay. Um, having said that, I'm going to, having said how wide, I was just talking on the way I met somebody on the plane and I said, how is you going to handle customs and excise when somebody like IKEA will be sending me designs over the net and I'll just buy some resin and manufacture the furniture in my house at home? Suddenly, even goods and services are coming to me over the internet. All I need to do. So everything changes. So we should, it is a very vast discussion, which is why I have decided that we'll, we'll keep the uh, the, the, this, the, the talk's small, we are out on Twitter. I've got about a hundred, within ten minutes, I've got a hundred people with a hundred questions from all over the world now. Uh, we'll keep the speeches small, but if we could then keep the questions within the diametrics that each speaker has taken up, and then we can have an open discussion, because it's so vast. Okay, so I'm going to invite, uh, uh, who wants to go first? Dr. Gairola, yeah. Um, Dr. Gairola is member national innovation, uh, member secretary national innovation council, mission director national national e-governance plan. He's one man that I will learn. I keep talking about new media, and then I come to him and say, hey, "This is what's going to happen." He's always one step ahead of me. He says, "Ah, but that was yesterday. Today, this is what's going to happen, and very soon he'll be telling me tomorrow was it." But when he tells us what's going to happen tomorrow. He's the guru. All right. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sekhar. I think <coughs> when we discuss, two of us, it is he who comes out with the idea, and I, I am the person who looks at technology for it. Uh, today, at this point, I would just like to take two points. One is the democratization of informa information that Sam has been talking about, and what we have done in this country about how do we put the information out. About six, seven years back, we had right to information. What it did was empowered every citizen to get information from government closets. Prior to that, it was impossible to understand what government is doing and how government is doing. And over the period of six, seven, eight years, it had a very positive impact on awareness of people about the functioning of the government. But that was mostly a reactive part of information dissemination from the government side. About a year back, the Department of Science and Technology has come up with called National Data Sharing Policy. What it does is it reverses the role of a, from a reactive to a proactive system. So every department, every organization of the government of India has to proactively release the data sets in the open domain. And it's a very interesting story that we, we got. It was Sam and his colleague partner in U.S 
who once came in and Samir who is sitting here, we sat together and said, hey, is it possible for us to build a platform, an open platform between US government and the government of India? And we started about a year, year and a half back. A software piece was developed, which is released in the open source for everybody in the world to use it. Both US and India have started using it. And today, we have about five to 6,000 data sets from almost all government departments put in there. So the idea here is this is now available to the public for its usage. What we have now done is we are trying to get the apps on top of it, encouraging various competitions to use this data for things like social audit. How do we do the participative governance? All these issues will hopefully settle down in a year and a half when you have new type of applications being built by the community. So it's a community participation in looking at the data sets and seeing the performance of the government, seeing what's happening in the local areas, and encourage the innovation and use of this information. The second part that I thought I would like to bring it to your notice, and I have been discussing all over, is that you cannot do anything unless until you provide access to everybody. Providing a broadband access is a very, very crucial element in everybody's. Yesterday I was hearing, um, yesterday about the health, about the tuberculosis and how do we really handle it. So whether you talk about governance, you talk about health, you talk about education, access becomes a very basic requirement for everybody. Over the last four years in Government of India, we have taken three initiatives. The first, which a colleague of mine must have explained in the previous session, was National Knowledge Network, which connects knowledge institutions, 1,500 of them, with a view to collect and exchange knowledge among knowledge creators. As soon as we built that system, we realized that this knowledge has to go down to everybody. How do we really do that? So it's about three years back, three and a half years back, we started pestering Mr. Petrola that he must try and build a large infrastructure of providing fiber in a panchayat. So the first question that he asked me was, why do you want a 12 cores, each core having something like 100 lambdas and each lambda going on 10 gigs, so you're talking about hundreds and thousands of gigs. What will you do with a panchayat? Do you need it? So my answer to him was simple, that we are trying to build an ecosystem using which every child should be able to learn and do what he thinks is right. Education, health, governance will be delivered using that, but will have much more impact. So what we did to convince the whole government, we, two years back we set up a project. It's called Kanpura Project, where actually the, the, what Sam mentioned was Mr. Obama, when he came, he desired that we should connect a panchayat to show him in his meeting in one of these St. Xavier schools in Bombay. And we connected it. And we were told by the Department of State that you get five minutes because you are wasting President's time. Ultimately, he stood there for 45 minutes and since then, they had been visiting different times, different set of people to understand what is the implication of providing access and connectivity to a last mile? What transformations does one have? I am happy to report that this, these villages that we have connected, every child, every lady understands what network is. They know how to go and sell their produce. They know how to apply for their scholarships. They know how to get admissions. Each and every kid in that village has learned his own way. Somebody wants to paint, somebody wants to do something else. So the idea that we had was give them the access, allow them to have a free play and see how they grow, rather than doing a top-down approach. With this experiment, finally government agreed, and we have now invested 21,000 crores. I don't know what the dollar would really mean. A lot. About five billion or so dollars have been put in. Right. Realizing that this is not a business viability today. So we might put a fiber, but still who takes from a panchayat, which is a point of presence, to a village home? We realize that it is not possible for us to build that demand because demand doesn't exist. So what we did is we said, okay, we'll create a close user group, extending national knowledge network to make sure that all government-owned structures are connected with 10 Mbps each. So the third project, which is in the pipeline now, would talk about four to 5,000 crores, which is about 
a billion dollar, and about half a billion dollar annually to be provided by the Ministry of Rural Development to bridge these three together into a single seamless closed user group of about five to six million government employees. Because e-governance or service delivery cannot take place unless until we have good access. The last problem that we are still struggling through and trying to build on technology front is the access from these point of presence to the homes. We understood yesterday from Australia that they have built a fiber network and they were talking about taking fiber to the homes. I understand that has been dropped and they are now at the point of presence. Because carrying fiber or the bandwidth from individual location to a geography is a difficult task. So what we are now experimenting is to use the, the normal cable TV to carry the internet bandwidth as well. We have done some experiments and we hope that that will be one of the ways of providing internet broadband to the last mile. And it will be cost effective and it also will have leveraging that the entertainment and the broadband can go together. On the last thing on the, on the uh, social media, I think who is the better person than Shekhar who will talk about. But what I have been told by all the people who are working on the social media, you give us access. We will build the tools and technologies for social media which will be relevant for the people and will have a relationship between government and the people. So my feeling is that once we have these infrastructure in place, the social media will grow, both the existing social media and the new platforms of social media, which will come up, which will try to have sectoral solutions, community development will take place. And I think with that, I will stop. And thank you very much for having given me time. Thank you, Shekhar. Thank you, Dr. Ganala. Um, that was really, really very clear and very well said. I have a question, but I'm not, not going to ask my question. It's not my phone. Um, um, I'm going to leave somebody else if they have this question in mind. The bad news, the bad news of what you just said is that we're spending billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure to give people what we think they want. The one thing we do know is that what people want is the most unpredictable thing. And how do we know? That's the bad news. The good news is on social media, you'll know in an instant. They'll tell you right away. We used to make movies and say, hey, we've spent $100 million on this movie. It'll last at least three days. Guess what? After the first show, everybody knows if it's a good, bad, or an indifferent movie. So the good news is that they'll tell you very fast. But that will always be, always be. Content is not only what we give people, which is what you're talking about, this huge infrastructure that gives content, but content is what people want, and that's what we have to go out. And I have learned from my experience that every culture has a different desire for content because they live in different circumstances. So while Australia's experience may be very relevant to us, ours won't be the same, or definitely won't be the same as the US. So maybe that question does arrive. And coming to now, the big boss. Uh, Aditeshwar Seth runs Google in India. Um, we all have our own opinions about Google. I love it. Some people hate it. I love it and hate it too. I think that one question that I have, which I'll, I hope somebody will ask him and put him on the spot, is big data. All of us are really concerned about big data. This huge data, what are you going to do with that? And is it something that we should all be afraid of? Or is it something that we sitting in the Innovation Council can use and understand our cultures and understand our people and use the tools. So what are the tools of using big data? Sometimes we are afraid that those tools are used against us. How do we develop tools of big data that will be used for the very ideas of inclusive uh, innovation and development in every area that we're talking about? So once Google is everywhere and internet is everywhere and all the kids are, how do we use the data that is generated to find better ways of using not teachers but facilitators. Okay, it's over to you. That was just my question. It doesn't have to be the purpose of your eight minutes. Sounds good. Thanks, Shekhar. Can I have that? So do you want me to answer your question before? Or no, I'm hoping question? somebody will ask you. Okay, so. sounds good. All right, so um, in front of you, uh, and I'm going to I, I listen to Ramji very carefully. So when he says that 5% of what I say you'll remember and 50% of what I show you you'll remember, so I'll put up a lot of pictures. 
And since I'm on Shaker's panel, I have to start with a story. Um, in front of you is a wonderful image of India. It's an image of India that uh, most people in India do not enjoy. Oh. Ah, thank you. Um, so our mission at uh, Google is to organize all the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Um, this is working great for the first 100, 150 million people in India, but is it working for the billion people who are left behind? Um, and I would say that it is not really working for them because they are not information users, and if you went and said, you're going to be using the internet in the next five years, they would say, I don't know what that means. Um, let me postulate that uh, the average person on the planet is surrounded by what I call dark knowledge. This is knowledge that surrounds them, envelops them, and drags them down. Um, instead of giving you a theory, let me give you an example. Um, this is a driver in Bangalore. I have renamed him, and I call him Param. And Param is an exceptional driver, but he's also at the edge of poverty. And uh, here's the reason why. I went around in my neighborhood, and in this upper middle class neighborhood I happen to live in, and asked every person what they pay their driver, and the variation was 20%. And if you go to any IT company in Bangalore and look at the variation of how much money they pay their employees, just the engineers, the three sigma will be a factor of 10, 1,000% versus 30%. And the reason why is Param is surrounded by this knowledge which is not in his head and not in the head of his employers, which is how good of a driver is he compared to others? He doesn't know, neither does his employer. Um, what are the opportunities out there if he knew uh, where to find a good employer? He doesn't know, and neither do the employers know how to find him. And this goes on and on. And uh, for those of us living in India, it's a common coffee table conversation to bemoan the lack of skilled labor. And if you ever wonder why we are missing high quality skilled labor in India, I would postulate this is the reason why. And what I mean by that is when we miss information systems, which will amplify the good ones and drag down the ones who are not doing so well. There is no incentive for people to up themselves. And when you don't have incentives, people obviously don't respond. You know, Herb Simon said that. So um, having said that, having set the stage of the problem, um, I will make another assertion, which is even more bold, that poverty, uh, which is something that India does and should struggle with and is our primary focus as a country, is an information problem that at least to the extent that we have analyzed poverty in the last one year, we've been you know, doing research after research. We have not found a single root cause of poverty that is not due to a missing information system, whether it be the skilled labor I just talked about, or construction workers where 30% of their income is taken by the tout, or you know, school children, uh, little fanmans uh, who are out there who are unable to get to world-class information, or health reasons where 25% of all people who go below the poverty line from above in India do so because of a simple health issue that they do not know how to resolve. And um, having said that, um, there are bright spots, as always, and uh, two of them I will point out just to show that if you actually build information systems, this can have scalable impact, and these are um, not that scalable because the information systems have been missing, but all, at the, all the same, they tell us what is possible if we actually build such systems. So one is uh, Hiware Bazaar. Many of uh, NGOs in India wouldn't be aware of this village. This village was at the edge of elimination 20 years ago. The people in that village were about to wind up and probably move to Bombay or something, Mumbai, excuse me. And um, that did not happen. It did not happen because this one gentleman whose picture you see in front of you um, read information that the government has been publishing for years about um, sustainable agriculture, water harvesting, and so on, implemented it, and now that village has 60 million, uh, 60 millionaires uh, who are self-grown and homegrown. And in Rwanda, um, by mass marketing mitigated mosquito nets, which the UN has been proposing for years and years, uh, Rwanda eliminated 70 to 80 percent of malarial deaths. Um, so having said that, what do information systems for the next billion look like? Now I'm going to go on hyperspeed mode because I need to wind up, but I wanted to you give got, you a flavor. You've got a little more time. I know. 
uh, but I also have a lot of slides. Um, but um, I, I want to not walk you through every detail of what the internet for the next billion looks like and what we are doing, but give you a flavor of it because this can go on for hours. Um, this is the internet that all of us sitting on this table use and enjoy. Would you believe that a, the person I just showed you, Param, would be able to use this internet? Um, I would say that the text web does not work for them. And all of us in this room have one of these two in their pocket, either an Android phone or an Apple or a Blackberry or a Microsoft phone. Um, but are these phones useful for the next billion people? Um, and they are not, and I'll walk you through why in a, in a moment. And here's the reason why. So the languages that India is literate in are not lit up on smartphones today. Um, and even if they were lit up, if you wanted to type, other than English, it is impossible to type any other language from India on a phone or on a computer today. So here's a simple example. Um, this is one of the drivers who works at Google. Um, he's actually well above the state of middle class or the lower uh, part of middle class because he owns his own car and he employs people and uh, um, he's making well in excess of the $3,000 per year, which is uh, our level of middle class. And he loves computers. He sits in our lab and uses computers all the time. We have a lab for drivers when they have no, nothing else to do. And he, after using the computer for six months, took 24 minutes to type what's in front of you, 24 minutes, using the best tools out there of how language can be transcribed from his head onto the computer. And and all of this adds up to this very simple stat in front of you, um, which has been published recently. Less than 0.1% of all the content coming out of India is in an Indian language. And 90 plus percent of Indians do not know this language, which is English. And most of the content that they're seeing, 99 plus percent is in English. One of the reasons is they cannot type in any other language. The other reason is there are no reasons for them to move information online. Um, and I'll give you another economic stat. You know, big data, the cloud, internet, all of that has been powered by the economic cycle. Either people doing it for their work or people doing it because it gives them money which is coming from the ad engine or the ad cycle. The advertising uh, community is responsible for the internet we enjoy. And the interesting thing about that money is that 90% uh, of the disposable income consumed in India is consumed by the first 80 million people, sorted by income, which means the next 1.2, 1.15 billion people um, have no money powering their information or their internet. So one hypothesis is that crowdsourcing or the only way their information is come online will be the crowd. So what is Google doing about it? I'll spend a very small amount of time about this because that's not the focus of this talk, but it's instructive. Um, the most recent Android which was launched, one of its big features is that it is half the weight of its predecessor. It's 512 megabytes versus one gigabyte, and of course it is lit up in Indian languages. Um, the reason why we reduce its size from one gigabyte to half a, megabyte, half a gigabyte is the most expensive part of your phone is the memory. And we could not find, when we talked to OEMs, they said, we cannot reduce the phone down to the $50, $80, $100 you want us to if you don't reduce the memory footprint. So we did. Um, and the other thing that we're working on, uh, we are starting to work on with uh, uh, faculty across the IITs and uh, Wikipedia Foundation and so on, is we are starting to build a set of open source fonts uh, in Indian languages. Because without open source fonts, you know, it will not get adopted across all platforms and the publishers and so on. And the third thing is, uh, you know, so what your, let, let me replay that again. How do I go back with this? Can you, how do I go back? So this is a quick video of uh, uh, how today using um, just your finger, 
you can write the word Bharat uh, using handwriting. And this is one of the ways in which, we just launched it about a couple of months back, and this is one of the ways in which uh, we are making it simple for people to you know, bypass all their cognitive overload and bypass the lack of education and simply know what, use what they know and start interacting with the world in a natural way. Um, and uh, the other um, part of you know, using the internet, making it more useful for the next billion people is simple. It's actually make it visual. Uh, everybody thinks visually. You don't have to explain visual um, information to people. It's natural. Um, and uh, that's one of our focuses. And what Bharat Broadband is doing and what Sam is doing to build fiber into every village is not futuristic. It is not um, you know, pie in the sky. It is not ivory tower. It is necessary. If you do not get a megabit into each Indian's hands, they will not be able to use the internet. Um, and uh, one of the other things we are doing is uh, we are structuring the web. And uh, I'll explain why in a minute. But uh, when I say we, I don't mean Google. Um, and I say we, I mean all the search engines and the information companies in the world. So Google, Yahoo, Bing, which is Microsoft, and Yandex got together and founded this organization called schema.org, which, which has created this open set of uh, data structures, which they don't control, but the community controls. It's a W3C consortium. And um, by doing that, what we have found is already 20 to 30 percent of the internet has been annotated with these data structures that the community is creating. So not only is the data is being generated by the world, the structure of the data is being generated by the world. Now why is that important? It's important for the following reason. If you, um, if you look for uh, a piece of information, and these are the, you know, this is what you see in front of you, a um, lot of people uh, who are using the internet today can make use of that. But if you uh, look at what's to the right of you, uh, what we call a knowledge panel, um, that's a substantially easier way to consume the same piece of information. Um, a child can do it, a person who is barely literate can do it, and a person who is just coming onto the internet, the first generation learners can do that. So structuring the information actually makes the internet far more accessible. Um, another example, uh, which is closer to home, it's about a disease, and this is on Google today. If you search for this, this is what you get, uh, or you used to get, and today you also get this little knowledge panel on the right, which points you to symptoms, cures, what to do, what not to do, and so on. And this is not information that any one company created. Uh, because it is now uh, annotated with this data structure, the search engines of the world can find it, crawl it, and make the information far more useful than it has been before. Um, and the other part of the web that I talked about is the visual web, which is um, what if you, and, and this is something that we initiated after a conversation with Sam, Sam about a year ago. And Sam said, look, I don't know how long it will take, two years, four years, we will get internet into everybody's hands. Find us content that is useful for people. And uh, we embarked on this mission to make um, education on the internet far more fun, interesting, and useful. And uh, the insight that we found was that we don't have to invent the content. We don't have to pay people to create the content. Most of the content actually has been already been created. And it's been created worldwide. There's amazing educational content already out there. So we found um, a whole bunch of you know, great teachers coming from this foundation we, many of you know called Teach for India and collaborated with them. And they've been curating one of the largest, uh, highest, most syllabus in the world, the CBSA syllabus, for the last year. And uh, it's probably ready for time, prime time in the next month. It's already ready. We are doing experiments to make sure it actually works. We are working with schools right now to make sure it works, and they already given us feedback. We are uh, going through that process. And I'm going to give you some, say something more interesting about this, that our goal is not to curate it ourselves. Our goal is to make this the starting point, because we cannot curate all the content in the world forever. Um, and this is a little snippet, or sets of snippets, of what this content looks like. So this is a video that explains digestion to a five-year-old. Um, or the digestive system to a five-year-old. And uh, here's a little snippet um, which explains shapes to, again, a five-year-old. Uh, what does a cuboid mean? What does a cube mean? 
if you look at textbooks and you put them side by side, uh, this is a much better way to, for a kid to learn versus reading the textbook. It does not replace the teacher, but it does start replacing the textbook. And here's an example of studying history about the Harappan civilization. I wish I had learned the Harappan civilization this way versus the way I remember learning it. Um, and so in, in summary, um, all of us kind of have talked about crowdsourcing. Um, crowdsourcing to me means three things which have rarely been brought together. It is the, the, in, the source of information has to be the crowd. The curation of the information must also be with the crowd, something that's rarely done. And the dissemination also must be with the crowd. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's assume there is this, you know, village in India where fiber has reached and some people, the early adopters, start consuming information. Um, when the neighbors know what they're consuming, they're more likely to engage with that than some global information source that uh, they are not aware of. And I'll give you quick examples of crowdsourcing. This is the last slide. Uh, the first one is my previous journey, which was born out of uh, uh, Mr. Hernando de Soto's insight that maps are critical for economies' development. And this is MapMaker, and what you saw was how the world was mapped. And the second one is a launch we did recently where closed captions in YouTube can now be done by anybody in the world. You don't, the video owner doesn't have to do it. Anybody can go and first caption a Khan, Ac Khan Academy video in Hindi or Canada or whatever language. And the third one is an experiment we are doing, which is around civic issues and civic engagement or any other uh, curated issue, which is can, it, can people put up their own information, can communities own information and activities around that. So with that, I will stop um, and uh, stop with a story uh, of one of my heroes. When we had built MapMaker and launched it, um, this gentleman in the middle, his name is CNR Nair, said that the cities will be mapped by the young guys. They live in the cities, they know what to do with this, they'll map the cities. But rural Kerala will not be mapped unless I do something about it. So Mr. CNR Nair made it his life's mission uh, four years ago to map every part of rural Kerala. He first started doing it single-handedly. He himself contributed more than 160,000 changes to the map. And then his enthusiasm was so infectious that young people around Kerala joined him and became the first, he began the first rural mapping initiative around the world. And rural Kerala turns out to be the first um, mapped rural state or region in the entire developing world. And what to me is uh, touching and makes him my hero is there are many people like that, but he did this while he was uh, suffering with cancer. And we lost him about a year ago. And, uh, but the impact that he's had on the planet uh, will last forever. And what this tells me and us maybe is that uh, our job is not to build the content for the world. Our job is not even to build the distribution platforms for the world. Our job is to build systems which allow people to explore, be expressed, and do it entirely by themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, taking off from that, I have a confession to make, and this is one hell of a platform to make a confession, but I'll, can I do it? Right? Yes, I am. Um, it's a little story. Um, I gave my phone to my daughter, who's just become a teenager, and I ensured that every text that she sends and receives gets transmitted to my phone. Bad daddy, right? However, here's what happened. I couldn't understand anything. They have a, there's an emotive language that is being developed on the internet that has nothing to do with the ABC and word formation and sentence formation that we know. It's a mixture of text and emoticons and what is fascinating about it, the context in which it is said and the relationship with that person is as important as the characters themselves. So a question I hope somebody will ask you is, are we being arrogant by, is Google being arrogant by saying we'll develop an, a language that everybody can get or will, when, as you get into crowdsourcing, will the crowd themselves develop a language that Google will have to and all of us will have to adapt to? So, no, I'll wait till other people let come. Me, okay. Let me quickly answer that, Pith. Um, that's actually exactly my point. Yeah, okay. 
So the language that we are talking about is owned by the people. We don't develop it, we only create the platform and let people define the structure and the language that they want. And you think that will become a kind of an international language over time? It's up to them. Yeah. Very quickly. All right. Yeah. All right. This time I'm going, to, I'm going to get the names right. Okay. Now, Adideshwar Seth is actually the co-founder and CEO of Gramvani. Uh, the interesting thing is, other than uh, all the other speakers, he actually works with the crowd. He is part of the crowd. He's got a radio station that works with the crowd. So he, he understands how people are responding to all what we are throwing at them. So I'm going to give you the platform. Great. Thanks, Shekhar. Could I have a clicker? And he'll explain how he's doing it with his radio and internet together. Right. Yeah, I, and uh, I'm actually very happy to be speaking after Dr. Gerola and uh, Raditesh because uh, they've left off uh, at the point where uh, we know that uh, government and everybody is making a lot of effort to bring internet to the people. And then uh, folks like Google are making efforts so that uh, people are able to access the internet. Uh, so I'm sort of uh, going to talk about uh, that before we actually get there, um, how do we? Uh, how do we see technology transfer. This <laughs> reverse side. Ah, yeah. Right. Uh, well, uh, so the reality actually is that uh, there's there's a lot of illiteracy out there, and which basically means that text-based platforms are going to be challenging for people to use, and. Uh, uh, other than illiteracy, we also know that income levels are a problem. So whether people are going to be able to afford phones uh, and afford internet packs on the phones, whether that's going to be a challenge or not. So uh, in the future, whether it's the internet or whether it's smartphones, it doesn't matter. What do we do as of now? And uh, some of the innovations that we've actually done is that in today's scenario, um, we use uh, the very basic ordinary mobile phone uh, in a voice-based manner. Uh, we've built IVR systems. Uh, IVR stands for Interactive Voice Response. And this is what you typically get in a call center, right? where you call and you get this automated thing saying press 1 for this, press 2 for this, and so on. So we've actually built applications on top of that which enable uh, people to use it as a social media platform, right? a voice-based social media platform uh, for that matter. So people can call and uh, they can just choose between two simple options in the very basic version that they can either leave a message or they can listen to messages left by other people, right? And they can comment on these messages. So it becomes like a voice-based discussion forum. And uh, it's a moderated forum, so which means that we have our own content moderators who listen to recordings that have been left by people and then figure out which ones to publish, uh, which ones to reject, whether to edit the audio on that or not. And uh, then we build reports out of this, which we take to different stakeholders, which would be government departments or nonprofits or others who are working in the area. Uh, so now the uh, very interesting thing is people are using it in all sorts of cool ways. Uh, there's folk songs and poetry which happens on the forum, so people actually sing in the phone and leave the recordings which others can listen to. Um, there's also a lot of question answering which happens on agriculture and health, so people would call and ask questions and then we've tied up with uh, local NGOs who help answer these questions. So the good thing is that the information becomes very, very contextual for the people. It's absolutely bottom-up information creation. People are asking questions, and people from the same community are helping answer those questions, right? as opposed to you know, some expert sitting in Delhi who's trying to answer the questions of a farmer in some village in Dhanbad, uh, because there's a language problem, there's a rapport problem. Uh, so this system really gets around that. Um, another uh, very impactful way in which the system is being used is about uh, people reporting on government schemes about what's working in Areca, what's not working, what problems are they facing. So it's actually very interesting qualitative data which actually comes and which is very useful for governments for policy uh, formulation. Uh, so we started this work in Jharkhand, which is a state in central India, and uh, we've gotten some very good uptake in the last, some very good uptake in the last one in the U.S. because I know them and they know about this conference. I know of at least 50, 60 friends on West Coast, East Coast, Chicago. They are all watching this on a regular basis, even at midnight. So what you will see here is some of those results. Um, so may I just open 